So, um, as you may or may not know, um, it, it has taken a long time for critics to look west, as it were, uh, to admit that there might be chaotic influences in Tolkien's works, just because he had once, only once said, my tales are not chaotic. I personally think it's not that big of a reason not to go there. But anyway, uh, there is, however, one instance in which we cannot deny Celtic inspirations. It is uh, in The Lost Road, the, uh, the, top, the fifth book, sorry, of the history of Middle-earth, in which Tolkien precisely talks about Fintan, the oldest man in Ireland, and Tiernan Og, saying he wants to write a story of Tiernan Og. So uh, those two elements of Celtic traditions have to do with death and immortality. Uh, we are going to look at them both and try to find out what Tolkien found in them, how, what they are first, how Tolkien used them, and if there is really a strong influence for reincarnation and immortality coming from Celtic tradition in Tolkien's work. Let's start with the easy part first and go to Tiernan Og. Uh, Tiernan Og is one of the main names of the Celtic Otherworld. And there I have to uh, give you a little precision. The Celtic Otherworld has been assimilated by Christian tradition to paradise. But that doesn't mean that for the Celts, it was the land where people went after they were dead. It is the other world, another dimension, the place where the fairy folk live, out of time and space for us mortals. But it is not paradise in a triptych of paradise, purgatory, and hell. It is paradise in the pagan term of a place of pleasure, a place of joy, where there is no stain, where there is no death, where there is no pain, and where everybody finds what they really need. Other than that, there is no mention of paradise in the Christian uh, acception of the world. <coughs> this land, this place, has many names, uh, such as the land of the living, the land of women, and we see that the Celts were really saw this as the right for men, but anyway. Uh, the Great Meadow, the Meadow of Pleasure, or Tiernan Og, the land of the young. The, 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 the term that encompasses all these exceptions in, uh, in ancient Irish is the she. It means peace, it's the place of peace. It is situated approximately everywhere. Well, out of time and space, so it can pop up pretty much everywhere. Uh, but there is a strong tradition to say it is west. West of Ireland, beyond the sea, beyond the setting sun. And then again, not so far away that you cannot reach it if you are a worthy mariner and you sail west searching for this paradise. So it is at once there and not there, roughly in the west, and a place that worthy people can hope to reach. It is also pretty much next door through any tumulus, cave, lake, any kind of physical barrier that could be a doorway to this other world. Um, later on, it was to be known uh, in, in the name, in, under a name that you've all heard of, Avalon, the island of apples, the realm of Morgana, where Arthur is taken to die. So you either have to be a really good mariner or a dying king to reach it in your mortal days. <coughs> Otherwise, it is really a place that very few mortals ever see. And if they do, they might not be that better off because it is, once again, out of space and time, especially out of time. So you go there, and when you come back, everybody you knew is dead, and the world has changed as we have many, many occurrences of Celtic tales. So, to anyone who knows Tolkien's works, the similarities are pretty obvious. We have once a land without stain, without death, where everybody is eternally young, 
And that is beyond space, beyond anything we can reach. Well, that is Valinor after the end of, of the Second Age, where it can no longer be reached by any geographical routes, but has to be uh, at the end of the Lost Road, beyond the door of dates. And yet, the Irish tell us, told, told us, you can try to find the Blessed Island. Well, there is a Blessed Island in Tolkien's world as well, which is Tolerisea, that can hopefully still be reached by, uh, by normal means, as Frodo and his companions do at the end of the Third Age. This blessed island is usually surrounded by enchanted islands, not so blessed and not so benign, uh, which are also present in Tolkien's world when the Valar, after the treason of Melkor and the exile of Fionor and his companions, decide to place numerous islands enchanted uh, with spells and shadows to stop people from trying to reach Valinor. And finally, um, well, we have pockets, as it were, of uh, fairy realms within Middle-earth itself. Uh, if I tell you of a place without death, without stain, with magical light, where you can find whatever you need, whether it is rest, or sing, or song, or tales, or food, that is usually um, fenced by a river. That doesn't seem that much of a barrier if you've been allowed to pass, but amazingly, uh, people like Nazgul or Orcs or Gollum, they just can't pass this little thing of water. Well, we have Rivendell and Rothlorien, of course, in which also time is very, very strange. In The Hobbit, time is distorted in Rivendell for narrative purposes because Tolkien says, when people are happy, there's not much to tell. So, okay, all the time we spend in Rivendell is summarized in a few pages. And of course, in Lorien, when Sam tries to work, work out the, uh, the faces of the moon, and he just cannot do it, and we never have a definitive <coughs> answer as to why is the moon acting up. Uh, Legolas tells us, yeah, but the time is not the same for you, it's quicker for me, it's slower. Okay, so in the end, we don't know. So concerning uh, the, uh, the Celtic other world, the inspirations are quite obvious. The images of Celtic traditions are very powerful. And as such, Tolkien used them in his legendarium and they really add another layer of magic up to the final image of Frodo and his Arthurian death. Uh, just one quick word in case there are anybody here doubtful of the result of the answer. Uh, Frodo doesn't go, of course, to Valinor, because I still have people telling me this. Uh, Frodo goes to Tolerisea, and there is a text from Tolkien called The Sojourn of Frodo in Tolerisea, so just to be clear. So we have determined the inspirations, uh, the otherworldly, Celtic otherworldly inspiration in Tolkien's work. Now we're coming to the more complicated idea of Celtic immortality. Um, the, the Celts, or the fairy folk, are immortal pretty much in the same way as the elves are, in, in that they are beautiful and young, and they are not uh, submitted to old age or decay. They can, however, be wounded or killed. So, once again, we have a very clear inspiration in that regard. Um, and on the other hand, there is also this important element of the absence of apocalypse in the Celtic mythology. There is no Ragnarok for fairy folks. They are not doomed to be squashed by giants or any other people. They do fight with mortals in Ireland for the land of Ireland, but in the end, they agree that the mortals will have the physical land and the fairy folk will retreat in the other world. So they, they do not die out, ever. And we still have this idea that uh, we can't see them, it doesn't mean they are not there. And people don't believe in them anymore, so they're not going to show up, but they're still around, or they could be. And 
in comparison, the northern gods, well, they have a Ragnarok, so thank you, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> However, in this general tradition of immortality of the fairy folk, we have several characters that are especially famous for having long lives. And among them is the one Tolkien quotes, Fintan. Uh, there is some doubt uh, among scholars as to an um, old copist, as to whether Fintan and Tuan Macariel are the same character or not. They seem to have the same pattern of life, which is they enjoy several centuries of life under various life form. Animals, mostly, they, uh, two centuries as a stag, three centuries as a boar, and then after several steps, the final transformation is into a salmon, the salmon of knowledge of Celtic tradition, that you can eat without killing it, which is pretty much handy. Uh, and then finally, after being eaten as the salmon of knowledge, Fintan is reborn, he becomes a man again, and he can testify to the various invasions of Ireland to St. Patrick's and Catholic monks. So it is very practical to have a man who has borne witness to all the stages of Irish history so that he can tell the tale. And I think it is the main reason why Tolkien was interested in Fintan, because it was at this stage of his um, legendarium where he was still hoping to link Middle Earth to our Earth. And then he was, so he was looking for means of transmission. And of course, a guy who lives several centuries is really handy to have around for that purpose. Um, Fintan is not the only one to have a long life. We have three more occurrences that I will go through very quickly. Uh, we have first the children of Lear, who are transformed into swans by an evil stepmother to live for nine centuries, and they turn back into humans just in time to be baptized, now that Ireland is Christian, and to die. And then we have uh, the story of Etain, the most beautiful woman of Ireland, who is also transformed into a larva and then an insect by a jealous, uh, the jealous first wife of her husband. Okay, okay there's cause for jealousy, but still. Uh, if you know, that's not going to be, okay. So I don't have my text anymore. <laughs> Everything is in it. Um, and so she is transformed until she is swallowed by a human woman and comes to life again as a new birth with the same name, uh, gets married again because she has no recollection whatsoever of her previous life until her first husband comes back, uh, wins her at a game of chess and gives her her memory back. So that's important details, we'll come back to that later. And then finally, we have the most famous bard of Welsh tradition, Taliesin who was first, uh, Guillaume sorry, I don't know how to pronounce Welsh, so, uh, who was uh, tasked by Edwin <coughs> to look after the cauldron of knowledge. He inadvertently tastes the potion, has unlimited knowledge, so of course the witch is not very happy, they fight, he, they have several transformations, and in the end, he changes into a grain of corn, she changes into a hen, swallows him, gets pregnant, gives birth to him, and he is Taliesin. And from the very moment of his birth, he is endowed with all the knowledge that was in the cauldron. So we have all these examples. Uh, what did Tolkien do with them? Not much. Because uh, immortality and reincarnation with the elves are very, very complex matters. Tolkien worked on them for decades without ever reaching an absolute solution because of theological problem. He was a Christian and the idea of reincarnation and rebirth could not be easy for him to handle. While he needed the elves to be immortal, so has to have the contrast between immortal elves and mortal men. But the first ideas he had about uh, elvish reincarnation which was made necessary by the fact that their bodies were of the stuff of the earth, and the earth had been wounded by Melkor, so they could die. Thus, they needed a new body, and he first thought of having them reborn. But there were two problems, social problems with that rebirth. 
which we can somehow see may be an influence of Irish mythology. The first problem was memory. What do you do if you are a, if you have a, rebir um, a rebirth body with an old spirit? Do you have this? The, the, the tally is in case of a child who is born with the faculty of talking and all the knowledge in the world. It is a bit grotesque. I think it's one of those moments where Tolkien would have said, I know genuine Celtic things and they are not pretty and elevated, they are gross. <laughs> and so he chose to have um, a system that is described in Laws and Customs of the Elder that says, Every child will be born as a child and given a name by their parents that will hold until they are 10 years old. And if their body is the new host of an old spirit, the memory of their previous life will come back to them little by little so that they can enjoy a second childhood with all the innocence and joy it entails. And then, when they are 10 years old and they remember their old lives, they can take on a new name or their former names and proceed with the renewed joy of, of having had two childhoods and then taking up the course of their new life. In this we can see, I think, the influence of Etain, who did not have her memory back until it was called upon by her former husband. So he had the two solutions and he took the second one. Speaking of Etain, the, the rebirth of uh, the, the, the elves gives us a second problem, that of marriage. Because in the tale of Etain, you have a very sad part and a very sad guy, the second husband. He didn't ask for anything. He married a woman who didn't even know she had had a previous life. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden he's told, OK, your wife was my wife. So if you don't mind, I'm taking her back. <laughs> and uh, for Etain, she was also in a state of bigamy, technically, without even knowing it. So uh, Tolkien, Catholic, was not likely to find this a uh, viable alternative. So he came up with, uh, with an idea, with a law, that is the statute of um, Finley and Muriel, uh, that says because if you know the story, Finway was widowed because Muriel died, and uh, after ten, he, he waited ten years, and then when he had admitted that he would not get his, his wife back, he said, "Okay, so what do I do? I am the only one who has had just one son, and I don't have a wife." And so the Valar made the statute saying that if one of the spouses were to die after due consideration and common consent they could call the marriage off, and then the remaining spouse would be free to marry again. So once again, there is no um, direct copy or inclusion of, um, of a Celtic story or, or image within Tolkien's legendarium. But we can see in the background how those Celtic legends might have raised a few problematic points that Tolkien did address. Because I find it strange that out of all the various problems that could come from the rebirth of uh, an old spirit in a new body, these are the only two that were addressed, and they, ca they come directly from the tale of Etain and the tale of Taliesin. So I think this, uh, these two examples, and I'm sorry, I don't have the time to go to Glorfindel, uh, because uh, I'm really running short, short on time. I think these two examples show very well how Tolkien was working with his uh, old and antique influences. When there was a powerful image that could be taken as such without any uh, clash between paganism and Christianity, he did not hesitate to take it. He took the, all the images of the Celtic other worlds and find, found a way to integrate them into his own uh, fantasy world. But when there was a choice between uh, Orthodox Christianity and pagan ideology, the choice was always clear. He could know about the pagan alternative or the pagan tales, but he was always going to choose uh, Orthodox Christianity first and trying to put forward ideas that would not 
clash with his own uh, faith. So with that, I hope I gave you a very quick <laughs> and clear overview of why uh, you have to go Celtic. Uh, also, <laughs> if you want to have a clear idea of the many and very rich influences that Tolkien used in his legendary. Thank you. Yes, just a quick observation about uh, the wearing of the tail. Could it be said that it's partially reflected in the tale of Turin and Neonor? Because, of course, Neonor loses her memories as well. It is his it is as if she is born of you without actually a physical rebirth. Um, I don't know, because in that case, uh, there is clearly the work of the dragon, and thus of Morgoth uh, behind. Yeah. Nieno loses her memory because she falls under a spell. So maybe, or maybe it's just a case of coincidence of two pagan influences coming together. Yeah. I, I, I don't know, because yeah, may, maybe because yeah, there is also an idea of curse in the in the story of Etain. And also so, about the incestuous strain because of course Etain's second husband then sleeps with her with his and Etain's daughter and takes her as a wife unwittingly as well as to invest in I I I would go yeah I, I don't know honestly I had never thought in that direction and yeah I would look into that. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on no the no no oh no problem no worries. Yes. Respect to war song or Finder's Celtic No, very honestly, to go very quickly over Glorfindel, um, I had a small part uh, showing the crazy story of Glorfindel because it is a case where Tolkien created a huge trap in which he, from which he couldn't get out, and when he tried to get out, he created a bigger trap, and it all ended quite crazily. But the main idea was the, uh, the fate of Glorfindel is really exceptional. And this is an idea we also find in Celtic mythology that long life or several birth, this, it doesn't happen to everybody. It happens with a clear purpose. Uh, the idea, the, the, the question concerning Glorfindel is what exactly is the purpose? Uh, what always frustrates me about Glorfindel is the whole idea of having him reborn and sent back to Middle Earth with Gandalf to help in uh, against the fight uh, in the fight against Sauron, and then what? Yeah, okay, he finds the Fellowship and brings them to Rivendell, and then what? He doesn't do anything more. So, what kind of a fate is that, and where does it come from? That that's a conundrum. Uh, really, the whole story of Glorfindel is like okay. All this for that. So that, that was my that, that was my conclusion. Quite frustrating too, but you didn't miss much in terms of Celtic for that. That's probably time. Oh yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Yeah.